So what if the history we've been taught for so long is but a fraction of the truth? We'll try to find out together in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. Our perception of human civilization has long been shaped by the narratives of prevailing powers and their legacies. We've come to accept a linear progression of human development, from primitive hunter-gatherers to sophisticated societies that build monuments, devise calendars, and pent the first written records, ultimately giving rise to the modern world we inhabit today. We consider ourselves the hires of this intellectual lineage, proud and confident in our understanding of the past. But what if there's more beneath the surface? What if these ancient tales concealed secrets that defined our understanding of the world? As we delve deeper into the annals of history, an alternative account begins to surface, one that challenges the established order and shatters the foundations of our knowledge. This hidden narrative has been suppressed, neglected, or brushed aside for far too long, but now the time has come to unearth the secrets of our enigmatic past. The story begins in 1947, when a Bedouin shepherd named Muhammad Ed Hibin was searching for a lost goat near Qumran on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. He accidentally stumbled upon a cave that contained large clay jars. To his surprise, inside the jars were parchment and papyrus scrolls wrapped in linen. The shepherd and his companions collected the scrolls unaware of their historical importance and sold them to the antiquities dealer in Bethlehem. Word of discovery eventually reached scholars who recognized the scroll's significance and began efforts to acquire and study them. Excavations led by archaeologists were conducted in the Qumran area, revealing a series of caves that contained additional scrolls and fragments, ultimately resulting in the discovery of around 900 manuscripts. These ancient scrolls became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. They contain a collection of texts such as biblical manuscripts, apocryphal works and documents related to the beliefs and practices of a Jewish sect likely the Essenes. Remarkably, among these manuscripts was a mysterious non-canonical religious text that had been long forgotten by human civilization. This text, known as the Book of Enoch, offers a fascinating perspective on the relationship between humanity and supernatural realms, including detailed descriptions of angels, demons, and apocalyptic events. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Enoch has challenged our understanding of history and offers a glimpse into the spiritual and mystical beliefs of ancient people. It reminds us that there is always more to learn and discover about our past and the role that supernatural beliefs have played in shaping our understanding of the world. So who is Enoch and why is he important? Enoch is a biblical figure mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in the book of Genesis. His story is quite brief in the Bible, but becomes more elaborate in the later texts such as the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch comprises five books. The book of Watchers, the book of Parables, the Astronomical book, the book of Dream Visions, and the Epistles of Enoch, containing about a hundred chapters in total. These chapters tell the story of Enoch, the seventh patriarch in the book of Genesis. However, the Book of Enoch offers a different perspective on the events leading up to the Great Flood, a different story than the Biblical one. According to the Bible, Genesis 5, 18-24, Enoch was the son of Jared and the father of Metsuselah, making him the great-grandfather of Noah. He lived in the antediluvian period before the Great Flood. The Bible states that Enoch walked with God, which suggests a close relationship between Enoch and God. Unlike other biblical figures who lived exceptionally long lives, Enoch is said to have lived for only 365 years. The Bible then says, Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. The Book of Enoch as an apocryphal text expands on the biblical account and provides more details about Enoch's life and experiences. 
In this text, Enoch is portrayed as a righteous man who receives divine revelations and is granted access to heavenly realms. He is shown the mysteries of creation, the workings of the celestial bodies, and the ultimate fate of humanity. Enoch also learns about the Watchers, the fallen angels who disobeyed God and caused corruption on earth. Enoch serves as an intermediary between the fallen angels and God, delivering messages of judgment and conveying the angels' pleas for forgiveness. However, their pleas are denied and they're condemned to punishment. In the course of his heavenly journeys, Enoch encounters various celestial beings, including the archangels Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, who provide him with additional knowledge and guidance. The Book of Enoch describes several journeys that Enoch undertook guided by the Watchers. These journeys took him too far off otherworldly realms that defy the knowledge and understanding of the time. Were these journeys merely symbolic, or is it possible that Enoch truly visited other planets or dimensions with the help of advanced alien technology? In later Jewish mystical texts, Enoch is ultimately transformed into the angel Metatron. In these accounts, Enoch is taken up to heaven, where he undergoes a metamorphosis and becomes a powerful angelic being serving as a celestial scribe and an intermediary between God and humanity. The Book of Enoch, originally written in the ancient Semitic language of Gies, is not a whole piece, but similarly to the Bible, it is a composite work made up of distinct sections that were likely composed at different times and by different odors. Each section has its own themes and messages, such as divine judgment, the relationship between humans and supernatural beings, and the importance of maintaining cosmic and moral order. However, there are also interconnected in various ways. According to one of the earliest legends related to Enoch, he established the knowledge of astronomy and cosmography and was responsible for creating the solar calendar. This knowledge is given in the astronomical book, also called the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries, which contains detailed descriptions of the movements of celestial bodies and their relation to the calendar. It reflects a blend of ancient cosmology, astronomy, and religious speculation. The astronomical book emphasizes the order and harmony of the universe as a manifestation of divine wisdom and offers guidance on the proper observance of sacred times. In the whole book of Enoch, angels play a significant role and are depicted in a more detailed and elaborate manner than in many other religious texts. There are two types of angels described by Enoch, the archangels and the watchers. The archangels are depicted as God's loyal servants who execute divine judgment and maintain cosmic order. Some of the key archangels mentioned in the book of Enoch are Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. They perform various tasks such as overseeing the natural elements, interceding on behalf of humanity, and guiding and protecting Enoch during his celestial journeys. The roles of these archangels in the book of Enoch are more elaborated than in the Hebrew Bible, but share some similarities with other apocryphal texts and later Jewish and Christian traditions. But the Book of the Watchers tells the story of the other type of angels, the fallen angels or watchers, who rebel against God by descending to earth, taking human wives and teaching humans forbidden knowledge. The Watchers or fallen angels are a group of angels who led by Azazel and Shemi Haza, rebelled against God by descending to earth. The offspring of the Watchers and human women are the Nephilim, a race of giants who cause corruption and destruction on earth. This further provokes the wrath of Yahweh, and according to the Bible, the consequence of this mingling between the fallen and mortals leads to the creation of half-angelic, half-human offspring. The story of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch is an expansion of the brief account in Genesis 6, 1-4, and it offers a more complex and morally ambiguous picture of the fallen angels than is typically found in other religious texts. The Nephilims are described as giants and savages who threatened and plundered mankind. 
for their unrighteous deeds, the watchers were punished and were sent to the underground prison, and Enoch became the mediator between the gods and the imprisoned watchers. Enoch's journeys between heaven and earth in his role as a mediator are also discussed in the book describing how he flew with the angels and saw the rivers, mountains, and very ends of the earth from above. Despite Enoch's intervention, the gods decided that the planet and its all inhabitants must be punished due to their wrongdoing. The punishment was a great flood that destroyed the Nephilim and left the watchers in their prison. Before the flood, however, Enoch was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. The Nephilim mentioned in the Book of Enoch are, are not the only place in the biblical canon in which they appear. In 1332-33, the Israelites visited a land inhabited by Nephilim who were so large that they made the Israelites look like locusts. Of course, many things in the Bible are seen in modern times as allegorical, and this is more of a philosophical myth than a historical record. The Book of Enoch provides a unique perspective on the relationship between the Watchers and humans, offering an alternative narrative on the events leading up to the Great Flood. However, there is archaeological evidence for a particular Great Flood in Earth's history which is mentioned in countless religious and cultural traditions worldwide. So did creatures like the Nephilim therefore really exist? Many people say it is just fiction and there is no evidence. But what if there is? Stories about giants have found their place in human history. If giants existed, as records from countless cultures suggest, then the Book of Enoch begins to look less and less metaphorical and allegorical, less like a fantasy myth and more like a manuscript based on actual history. Records of such events can be found in the mythologies of ancient peoples worldwide, particularly among the Babylonians of the Middle East. The ancient Near East, known as the Cradle of Civilization, was home to the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians and Assyrians, who developed the first written language, studied astronomy and created libraries. In the mythologies of these cultures, the gods came down to earth and taught them their arts and knowledge. The Book of Enoch and Sumerian mythology both describe a process in which advanced beings shared their knowledge and technology with humans, leading to their rapid development. It is quite intriguing to think about the precision with which ancient civilizations such as the Sumerians, Egyptians and the Mayans were able to align their monuments with celestial bodies. How did they gain such accurate astronomical knowledge? Could it be? that the knowledge shared by the Watchers was actually the result of contact with a highly advanced alien civilization. According to Sumerian texts, a group of supernatural beings visited Earth in the distant past. The Sumerians referred to them as the Anunnaki, which means those who came from the sky. The Anunnaki were perceived as gods by the Sumerians and modern thinkers such as Zechariah Sitchin and Erich von Däniken believe that they were an ancient race of extraterrestrial beings who came to Earth. The Anunnaki, according to Sumerian mythology, were a group of deities who descended from the sky to shape human civilization. They were said to have taught humans various arts, sciences and technologies, much like the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. This parallel between the two accounts raises the question, could the Watchers and the Anunnaki be one and the same? The Sumerian civilization, which emerged in the region of Mesopotamia around 4500 BC, is considered one of the world's first advanced civilizations. Their sophisticated knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, architecture, coupled with the striking similarity between the Anunnaki and the Watchers, suggests that there might have been a connection between these ancient texts and the possibility of extraterrestrial intervention in human history. First and foremost, both the Watchers and the Anunnaki are described as coming from the heavens or the stars, suggesting an otherworldly origin. This connection implies that these beings were not merely divine and in the mythological sense, but may have been visitors from another planet or even another universe. 
Their arrival on Earth, according to the legends, marked the beginning of a new era in human development, as they shared their advanced knowledge and technology with the primitive inhabitants. Another intriguing point of comparison is the physical appearance of the Anunnaki and the Watchers. Both are often described as humanoid beings of immense stature, with features that set them apart from humans. The Anunnaki were said to have shining, radiant faces, while the Watchers are frequently depicted as luminous beings. They both have wings and come from the sky. Moreover, both the Watchers and the Anunnaki are depicted as intermingling with humans, sometimes producing offspring that possessed extraordinary abilities. The mingling of the celestial and the terrestrial has been interpreted by some as evidence of genetic manipulation, suggesting that these beings may have played a role in shaping the human species as we know it today. The agrarian revolution that began around 10,000 BC saw humans moving from a lifestyle of hunting and survival to farming and settlement. By 9,500 BC, in what is now Kurdistan, people were growing barley, wheat, rye, oats, peas and lentils, and domesticating goats and sheep. The Kurdish people claimed to be descendants of the children of the jinn, or the children of the spirits, which some speculate is an ancient reference to the interbreeding between the Anunnaki and human women. The similarities between the Watchers and the Anunnaki are further bolstered by the fact that ancient Sumerian texts such as the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Biblical accounts share common themes and stories. The flood narrative, for instance, is present in both Sumerian and Biblical accounts indicating a shared cultural and historical context. This overlap suggests that the Watchers and the Anunnaki may have been different names for the same group of extraterrestrial beings whose influence on earthly human civilizations has been documented in various ancient texts. Despite the differences in storytelling, the underlying message is the same. There were beings beyond our understanding who intervened with human affairs. The stories of Enoch and the Anunnaki remind us that the codes of reality are not always what they seem, and that there may be more to the universe than we can perceive with our limited human senses. The story of Noah and the Flood in the Old Testament is said to have originated in Babylonian and Sumerian myths. Is it According to the Book of Enoch, Yahweh intervened with the Watchers' interactions with humans led to woelessness, chaos, corruption and sexual immortality. The Sumerians believed that the Anunnaki helped humans develop civilization, lending them to their knowledge and technology. Some believe this may explain the creation of unexplainable ancient monuments, such as the pyramids of Giza and Teotihuacan. The Book of Enoch describes the Watchers teaching humans metallurgy and mining, science and medicine, reading and writing, and how to read the stars. This is believed to explain why gold was such a significant part of Egyptian culture. It is intriguing to consider the Book of Enoch may reflect and retell the history of the Anunnaki, with the Egyptian pyramids being the most common example of something given by the gods or the help that the Watchers or Anunnaki gave to the ancient people. Al Makrizi, a medieval Arab historian, claimed that the pyramids were built by a king named Saurid before the Great Flood, and interestingly, Saurid in Hebrew is Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, Enoch speaks about the mysteries of lightning and thunder, which some suggest were intended to reveal the mysteries of energy and electricity. Nikola Tesla once said, If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. Which may relate to the Anunnaki who are believed to be trying to share secrets with humans through crop circles that contain complex mathematical equations, magnetic circuits and motors and other similar elements. Enoch was known by several different names among different cultures. He was called Saurid, 
Hermes, Idris, and Enoch. The Arabs referred to him as Idris, which means sage or forefather, while Jewish and Christian theology consider him one of the patriarchs before the flood and the seventh of the ten forefathers. Enoch was also the father of Methuselah, who lived to be 969 years old, according to biblical accounts. In the ancient book Legends of the Jews of Antiquity, Enoch is described as a king over men who ruled for 243 years. He was known for his incredible wisdom and the entire world would come to him for advice. Interestingly, according to the ancient Egyptians, Enoch was also the builder of the Great Pyramid, who is known to us as Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom. The Old Testament book of Genesis mentions Enoch briefly, with only five sentences dedicated to him. The text reads, and Enoch walked after God and disappeared because God took him. It is said that Enoch suddenly disappeared and in Hebrew his name means initiated, enlightened, and knower. Enoch as an initiate ensured that his knowledge would not disappear without a trace. According to these traditions, Enoch, due to his righteous and close relationship with God, was chosen to be transformed into the angel Metatron. The process involved Enoch's physical body being taken up to heaven, where he underwent a metamorphosis. His body was transformed into a celestial, fiery form, and he was granted immense knowledge, wisdom, and power. Enoch's new role included a variety of tasks and responsibilities. As a celestial scribe, he was responsible for recording the deeds of humanity. He also served as an intermediary between gods and humans, particularly in matters of divine knowledge and wisdom. In some texts, Metatron is portrayed as the highest of all angels, secondly only to God in authority and power. In this position, he is sometimes referred to the lesser manifestation of God. So in a way, the story of Enoch's transformation into Archangel Metatron highlights the potential for human beings to attain a level of spiritual perfection and transcendence that allows them to become part of the divine realm. It is interesting to note that for centuries, the Book of Enoch has been an important part of Christian and Jewish religious traditions, with many religious sects accepting the book as scripture. Additionally, some even suggest that the Book of Enoch was the inspiration of the book of Genesis due to their many parallels and overlapping stories. Therefore, the question arises, why is the book of Enoch not part of the Bible? The answer may be found in the differences between the religious traditions that led to the formation of the canon, as well as the political and cultural context of the time. Regardless, the book of Enoch remains a fascinating and thought-provoking text that challenges our understanding of human history and the role that supernatural beliefs have played in shaping our worldview. It may seem unbelievable that stories of the Watchers, Anunnaki and the Nephilim giants have been forgotten, the Sumerians ignored and the Book of Enoch along with the Gospel of Mary and Thomas censored from the biblical canon. However, these stories fundamentally alter our understanding of human history by presenting a new or forgotten old perspective on who we are. Perhaps these stories have not been entirely erased but allegorically retold throughout the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible, the Book of Enoch and other ancient writings. By reading the story of Adam and Eve allegorically, it is easy to see the parallels between the story, the Book of Enoch and other ancient writings. The authors of the story of Adam and Eve may have been retelling the stories in the Book of Enoch and the Sumerian story of the Anunnaki in their own way, inserting this important part of history allegorically into their own religious canon. Was Enoch's story merely a myth, or does it contain evidence of an ancient connection between humanity and advanced outwardly beings? As we continue to explore the mysteries of our past, it is essential to keep an open mind and consider alternative explanations for the enigmas we encounter. These ancient records continue to exist through time, reminding us of our history in different forms, so that we may one day remember 
our cosmic human lifeline. Enoch's tale is full of mystic elements like magical wisdom, demons, giants, fallen angels and divine encounters. But many scholars believe that the Genesis authors actually flipped the Babylonian myth which places the ziggurat at the peak of civilization, thus emphasizing that Genesis shares many elements with older Mesopotamian myths. But how so? Enoch is a really interesting character in the Bible. He's mentioned right between the stories of the first people and God's big decision to reset the world with a massive flood. The ancient people of Mesopotamia, where the Bible has some of its roots, believed that people should know about magic, farming and other secret stuff that gods know. But the Bible's writers thought differently, saying this special knowledge was for God and the other gods only. And there's another difference. Mesopotamian folks thought cities were great, but the Bible sees cities as a bad thing. Enoch's story really emphasizes this contrast. Today, we're going to look at Enoch's origins, which surprisingly go all the way back to the oldest god we know from Mesopotamian history. What's interesting is that even though Enoch gets only a quick mention in the Bible among a long list of names similar to an old Sumerian king list, a lot of books were late written just about him. This makes Enoch a pretty mysterious guy. Professor Seth Sanders links Enoch to much older Mesopotamian myths. He explores these links in his insightful book From Adepa to Enoch, Scribal Culture and Religious Vision in Judea and Babylonia. According to him, a key myth that influenced the Biblical and Enochian traditions is the tale of Adepa, a major character in ancient Mesopotamia. Adepa was so influential that some scribes even claimed to be him. Adepa was seen as a powerful sage who interacted with the gods and wrote significant religious texts. Enoch and even Moses are seen as similar figures, being described as heavenly revealers. Like Adepa, they meet with God and bring divine revelations to people. For example, Moses climbs a mountain to meet God and then returns with his teachings. Enoch does something very similar. The importance of these figures is their role as intermediaries between the divine and human worlds. The scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls often depicted themselves as existing in heavenly realms, much like a passage in Ephesians does. Notably, the first evidence of scripture comes from these scrolls. Despite Enoch not being considered scripture in modern Bibles, it was incredibly popular during the Dead Sea Scrolls era, surpassing many revered books of today. Professor Gabrielle Boccaccini suggests an ancient rivalry. She believes there were two Torahs, one featuring Moses as we have today and another one with Enoch as the central figure. These two factions seem to complete over Jerusalem's temple, an idea supported by Dead Sea Scrolls scholar Kip Davis. Dating back to Sumer, ancient sages traversed between heaven and earth to bring back wisdom in a shamanic role. They were believed to reveal divine secrets of the universe, often used to legitimize rulers' authority. This spiritual insight gave these sages a certain level of protection and power over others. They were often employed by kings and viewed as authority figures by followers of their religions. Even then, people criticized them, much like we critique religious leaders today, accusing them of profiting of their roles. An interesting fact is that Sumerian and Mesopotamian tales are well documented on clay tablets, many originals of which we still have. Unlike the Bible which was recorded on materials like parchment and papyrus that haven't stood the test of time, these ancient stories have been well preserved. As a result, we have direct access to the source, unlike biblical texts which often require guesswork to reconstruct. We have two major myths about ascents to heaven, Etanas and Adapus. In the myth of Etana, a Sumerian king named Etana is infertile and seeks the plant of birth from the gods. In the detailed story, an eagle breaks its promise to a serpent and eats its children. The serpent traps the eagle in a pit as revenge. 
Itana saves the eagle, who then helps him find the plant of birth by taking him to heaven of Anu, the oldest known god. After a couple of attempts, Itana succeeds and has a son. Itana was historically recognized as the first king of Kish in the Sumerian king list. This was a form of early mythological genealogy in Mesopotamia. Itana was seen as a stabilizing force in chaotic world created by the gods. Even though the Sumerian king list mentions several earlier kings, Itana's myth presents him as the first real king. Scholars suggest that the names of these prior kings, which often symbolize chaos or the primordial period's disorder, might be metaphorical fabrications. At its core, Itana's tale is a story about unwavering faith in the divine, a message that echoes through time. The myth invites us to trust in powers beyond our understanding. While these tales provide wisdom, it's wise to approach them skeptically. Interestingly, we have a documentation of the Etana myth before the invention of writing, with several seals showing a man ascending to heaven on an eagle's back. Meanwhile, the Adapa myth recorded during the Old Babylonian period gained popularity over time. Many of the powerful Neo-Assyrian kings such as Sargon II, who conquered Israel, were equated with Adapa. But do we know more about Adapa? In Mesopotamian mythology, there is a fascinating character named Adapa. His story, Adapa and the South Wind, has been pieced together from tablets found in Egypt and Assyria. The oldest records of Adapa come from Sumerian tablets dated between 19th to 16th century BC. His name often used in exorcism rituals and he was seen as a wise ruler. Some even associate him with the Apkalu, also known as Wana. Adapa's story goes like this. After a great flood when people were lost, Adapa emerged as a guide. He was a human and a faithful priest of the temple of Inki, the lord of magic and secret knowledge in Eridu city. Inki gave Adapa wisdom, but not eternal life. Once, when Adapa was fishing in the Tigris river for a temple offering, the south wind capsized his boat. Angry, Adapa used a magic spell to break the wind's winds, stopping it from blowing for seven days. Adapa, a human, disrupts the natural order of the world by stopping the south wind, which is essential for farming. This surprises Anu, the oldest known writing god, who calls Adapa to heaven for an explanation. Before his trip, Adapa is warned by his god Inki about a trick awaiting him in heaven. He will be offered deadly food and water. He is advised to accept garments and oil but refuse food and drink, mirroring the story from the Garden of Eden. In heaven, Adapa explains that the wind attacked him which amuses Anu. As advice, Adapa accepts the offered garments and oil but declines the food and water of life. When Anu inquires about his refusal, Adapa mentions Inki's instructions. This leads Anu to laugh at Inki's actions and pass a judgment on Adapa, which in turn explains why humans suffer diseases. Finally, Adapa is sent back to Earth. In ancient civilizations like Assyria and Babylon, wisdom literature, magic and mythology had key roles in serving the kings. Despite changes in power from the fall of Babylon to the rise of Persia, temples and priesthoods remain influential. Without a central king, scribes often became the key authority figures holding vast knowledge. The appearance of apocalyptic ideas coincident with the decline of native kingship. The Uruk king list pairs kings with notable sages who were keepers of secret knowledge and healers. One of these sages was Lamashtu, an infamous demon known for harming newborns in ancient Mesopotamia. This figure is considered a predecessor to Lilith, a key character in Jewish lore believed to be Adam's first wife. The moral of her story in a male-dominated society was a warning against wives, arguing with their husbands, especially about intimate matters. In the colorful landscape of ancient Mesopotamian lore, one hero stood against the evil demon Lamashtu, Adapa. A plaque from between 9th to 7th centuries BC shows Adapa dressed like a fish, protecting people from expecting mothers from the demon. 
This rich history tells us about a world where scribes gained power, demons were real threats and heroes stood up to fight them. This is an example of how power, mythology and cultural beliefs influence a civilization's collective consciousness. A fascinating question arises when comparing Judean scribes and Mesopotamian traditions. Specifically, there are clear similarities between the stories of Adapa and Enoch. Both are seen as celestial messengers from ancient times and are personified by scribes. Although their narratives don't share many words, there are striking structural similarities between the two suggesting a potential connection. For instance, Professor Jonathan Ben Dove noted a notable similarity between the astronomical knowledge in Enoch's story and Adapa's tale in Mesopotamian literature. This suggests a potential link between the two narratives during the late Persian period. By the end of the Persian period, the same individuals controlled the temples and educations in both societies. In Babylon, education was centered around Aramaic parchment writing. As native Babylonian families revolted against Persian rule, scribes assumed control of Babylonian temples. These scribes trained in Aramaic became teachers of Hebrew scribes, instructing them in writing. It's clear that Hebrew scribes during the Hellenistic period started to use an Aramaic script, which is seen in their writings. The influence of Aramaic scholars was broad, reaching throughout the Persian and Hellenistic empires, which affected intellectual culture significantly. Evidence for this can be found in the Aramaic Levi documents from the Dead Sea Scrolls. These documents use a base 60 mathematical system which is rooted in Sumerian tradition and also feature Babylonian style astronomy. The Adapa myth from Mesopotamia and the concept of the Apkalu, also known as the seven sages in Mesopotamian mythology, appear to have greatly influenced the orders of the Enoch literature. The number 7 often symbolizes completeness, perfection and divine order in ancient cultures. Enoch being the seventh generation from Adam and the Apkalu being seven sages shows their connection to divine wisdom and their high status. The Apkalu were thought of as semi-divine beings with great knowledge and skills that they share with humans. They were often shown as half human, half fish or bird and were admired as ancient wise men and helpers of civilization. The Enoch literature reflects the Apkalu in the character of Enoch and the heavenly beings he interacts with. Enoch, like the Apkalu, is depicted as a wise man who reveals divine secrets. The mix of human and celestial features in the Apkalu is echoed in the descriptions of angelic beings Enoch meets on his heavenly travels. To fully understand the origins and influences of the Enoch stories as well as the wider biblical accounts of creation and the flood, it's important to look at the significant historical finding. The first scholarly translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh was done by George Smith, a British Azurologist. Despite being self-thought, he worked as an expert at the British Museum in the late 19th century. In 1872, Smith revealed his important translation of the Flood Tablet, a part of the Epic of Gilgamesh that tells the story of a devastating flood and the survival of the hero. This significant discovery sparked a big reaction in the academic world, causing intense debate over its similarities to the biblical story of the flood. The common parts of the two stories, like a hero building a boat to survive a worldwide flood and taking animals with him, brought up interesting questions about the origin and universality of the biblical story. Could this discovery possibly challenge the whole origin? of the biblical story. Both the king's list from Mesopotamia and the genealogy in Genesis 5 feature individuals with extraordinary long lifespans and lineage that descends directly from one generation to the next. In both accounts, there's a connection to the divine. The king's list mentions rulers in direct contact with gods or having divine ancestry. While Genesis 5 relates descendants to Adam, who had a special bond with God. These similarities have led scholars to suggest that the biblical account might have been influenced by the Mesopotamian tradition, 
possibly during the Babylonian captivity. A notable figure in understanding this connection is Berossus, a 4th century BCE Babylonian priest and historian. He offered a key insight into the ancient Near Eastern context, shedding light on Genesis origins. He noted interesting parallels in the systematic approach to lineage and longevity in both the Sumerian king list and Genesis 5. Enoch's lifespan in the Bible stated as 365 years is particularly interesting because it matches the numbers of days in a solar year. This suggests that the biblical authors may have intentionally used a solar calendar system. It's a hint at the ancient Near Eastern culture where solar calendars were key to tracking time and organizing agricultural cycles. In Greek mythology, there is a similar figure to Enoch named Prometheus. Prometheus, a titan, defined gods by stealing fire and giving it to humanity, symbolizing his role as a benefactor and bringer of knowledge. This act of challenging the gods and bestowing wisdom on humans is comparable to what the Apkalo and Inki did and echoes the Watcher's actions in the Book of Enoch. This suggests that tales of divine beings interacting with humans, sharing forbidden knowledge and suffering consequences are common across different mythologies. Greek mythology is full of giants, powerful and monstrous beings who fought against the gods. Similarly, in the book of Enoch and Genesis 6, we see giants created when divine beings mate with human women. In the Book of Enoch, part of Jewish and early Christian traditions, rebellious angels called the Watchers descend to earth and teach humans forbidden knowledge. Both the Titans' rebellion in Greek mythology and the Watchers' rebellion in the Book of Enoch share the theme of divine conflict. These stories both describe struggles for power and the challenges to establish divine rule and the resulting consequences of these rebellions. These connections remind us that no matter how unique each cultural stories may seem, they often echo universal human themes. One figure stands out from our discussion – Enoch. From an obscure figure in Genesis, Enoch ascends to a central role in Enochian literature. His experience, mirroring those of divine figures like the Mesopotamian of Kalu and the Greek titan Prometheus. These figures, acting as intermediaries, embody themes of divine knowledge, rebellion and interaction with humans. This leaves us with an intriguing question. As we continue our journey into the depths of ancient mythology, what other connections will we discover? And most importantly, what secrets does Noah, the great-grandson of Enoch, hold that could further unravel the interwining threads of these ancient stories? Did Enoch knew something even more deeper about our true cosmic origins? Ancient legends, myths and religions from around the world have spoken of gods and angels not always in the spiritual sense, but actual flesh and blood beings interacting with mankind. Many of these ancient cultures had vast knowledge of mathematics and astronomy, attributing their knowledge as being hanged down from the gods. Who were these godlike beings known to one of the oldest civilizations, the Sumerians, as the Anunnaki? The Sumerian civilization, which emerged more than 6,000 years ago from the Stone Age, is credited with over a hundred of the earliest advancements for a modern society. These include agriculture, science, medicine, mathematics, kingship, laws, courts, judges, schools, and essentially all aspects of society that were integral to its development. But how did a civilization like this become so advanced out of nowhere? Is it possible that they were held by another more advanced extraterrestrial civilization? In recent times, one theory has been tremendously gaining popularity, the one about the ancient astronauts and the beings called the Anunnaki. Who were they? Did they truly exist? And if so, what was their purpose and the motivation for creating humanity? Thought to be the oldest civilization in the world, the southern Mesopotamian civilization of ancient Sumeria emerged around 3000-4000 BC. They left behind valuable evidence of their advanced society, including writing on cuneiform tablets made of clay and stone, which they invented. 
using a wedge-shaped stylus to impress symbols onto wet clay tablets, their writing system allowed for information to be preserved. For a long time, deciphering the cuneiform tablets proved difficult. In March 1843, however, thousands of tablets were uncovered at an Assyrian palace providing crucial evidence of an ancient kingdom. Within a decade, the ruins of the Sumerian capital city of Ur were also discovered. Here, researchers found the ziggurat of Ur cuneiform tablets and gold-adorned tombs. But what is interesting is that the cuneiform tablets found at the site reveal more than just evidence of an ancient civilization. They point to descriptions of a group of divine beings known as the Anunnaki or the princely offspring of God who, according to Sumerian belief, descended from the sky. The Sumerian civilization believed in hierarchy of gods called the Anunnaki, which the heavenly gods being the supreme deities. These beings possessed immense knowledge and power beyond human capacity, and their origin remains a mystery to archaeologists. The Sumerian tablets suggest the possibility of extraterrestrial origin for the Anunnaki, who played a significant role in the civilization's development. They were responsible for genetically engineering the human race, as seen in the Sumerian king list containing names of kings who lived for hundreds of years, leading researchers to speculate about the presence of extraterrestrial genes. The Sumerian king list is perhaps one of the most important ancient texts that perfectly describes a time in history where literally gods ruled for thousands of years. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Alaljar ruled for 36,000 years. They ruled for 64,800 years. One of the most interesting details about the Sumerian king list is the fact that the earliest list describes eight kings who ruled over Earth for a total of 241,200 years since the original kingship had descended from heaven all the way to the time of the Great Flood, which swept over the land and once more the kingship was lowered from heaven after the Flood. Could the ancient kings of Sumer have lived for hundreds or even thousands of years, making them our extraterrestrial ancestors? Some believe this question was answered over 35 years ago. In 1976, Zechariah Sitchin published the book The Twelfth Planet, revealing his interpretation of the Anunnaki deities. Sitchin believed that the Sumerian gods were extraterrestrial who landed on Earth over 450,000 years ago, created humans and played a role in their downfall during a great flood. But why did the Anunnaki visit Earth and create humans? According to Sitchin's hypothesis, they came to Earth to mine gold and created humans to perform the task. This theory is controversial, but provides evidence that the Anunnaki were the original creators of mankind. The Anunnaki claimed to have come from their planet Nibiru and could travel through stargates and wormholes. Zechariah Sitchin also claimed that the Sumerians learned astrology from the Anunnaki, which gave them a deep understanding of our solar system, including Venus and Saturn, and even depicted a tenth planet called Nibiru. Sitchin believed that Nibiru orbits the Sun every 3,600 Earth years and causes disruptions when it passes close to Earth. In 1983, the Washington Post reported a heavenly body as large as Jupiter and NASA had acknowledged the possibility of a large hidden planet due to gravitational effects observed in our solar system. Modern astronomers have detected a tenth planet larger than Pluto. Some believe that the Anunnaki came from Nibiru and created a shield on Earth using gold to help heal their own planet. So who exactly were the Anunnaki? The term Anunnaki comes from Anu, the chief god of the sky, and Anunnaki simply means the children of Anu, or it can be also translated as those who came from the sky. 
The three most prominent figures in the Anunnaki pantheon are Anu and his two sons, the half-brothers Enlil and Enki. Anu was the supreme god and ruler of the Anunnaki and was believed to reside in heavens, overseeing the actions of the other gods. Enlil was the god of the air and storm. He was the firstborn son of Anu and his rightful heir, so his role on earth was as the enforcer of his father's will. In a way, he was the main ruler of the planet. Enki was the second son of Anu. He was the god of knowledge, wisdom and creation. Originally, Enki was worshipped as a god of fresh water and served as the patron deity of the city of Eridu. Today, Eridu is often considered to be one of the oldest permanent settlements in Mesopotamia and perhaps even in the world. The ancient Sumerians also believed that Eridu was the first city in the world and they documented that belief in the Sumerian king list and the Eridu Genesis. At the current times, at least 18 layers of settlement have been found at the site, so chances are it really was the first city and probably the residence of Prince Enki. Over time, however, Enki's influence grew and this deity was considered to have power over many other aspects of life including trickery and mischief, magic, creation and fertility. In fact, it was Enki together with Ninhurzak, the ancient symbol of the powerful mother, who genetically engineered the first humans called Adamu. They did it by mixing their one DNA with that of Homo erectus and as a result created the Homo sapiens. It so reminds us of the biblical phrase that God created us in his own image. Initially, the humans were not able to reproduce. They were created in laboratories and were used as workforce to mine gold. Seeing how his creations, his own children in a way, were being exploited, Enki decided to take care of them. By going against Enlil's will, Enki secretly gave humans the knowledge of mating and reproducing. And not only, he had been teaching them the knowledge of the universe. Some theories propose that one of Enki's favorite places to reside was Atlantis and that in trying to protect his children, he with the aid of Arcturians established the Atlantean civilization, an isolated place where humans could live freely without being exploited by the Anunnaki. But this act enraged Enlil, in fact the Sumerian clay tablets describe a war between the two brothers. It comes out that the detonation of nuclear weapons in the 20th century was not the first time humanity had seen such a terrible destruction. Drawing upon the work of Zechariah Sitchin, the Book of Genesis, Sumerian clay tablets and archaeological evidence such as and ancient radioactive skeletons, there is a possibility of an ancient nuclear event that destroyed the Sumerian civilization as a result of power struggles of the gods. As his creator, the Anunnaki god Enki had a fatherly relationship with the first humans. But Enlil, who was acting as the sole commander of Earth, was enraged at his brother Enki for spoiling the Anunnaki bloodlines through interbreeding. This shift imposed a blackout not only of the very human nature of the Anunnaki gods, but also of humanity's own ancient past on Earth. There is a theory suggesting that two of Enlil's attacks against the Enki clan and humanity are described in the stories of the Deluge and the Tower of Babel. His final attempt after coursing the assembly of the gods into voting yes was the nuclear bombing of five cities of the Jordan Plain, including Sodom and Gomorrah, which resulted in the destruction of the Sumerian civilization and the Anunnaki's own civilization on Earth, including their spaceport in the Sinai. The Terra Papers tells that after the war, Enki was exiled from the planet. However, he still continued to teach humanity spiritual knowledge and to aid them in their development. The Anunnaki were known in ancient Babylon as Sire, which carries the meaning of dragons or big serpents. And the Anunnaki god Enki was associated with the Brotherhood of the Snake and was often represented by two coiled snakes of Caduceus, a symbol that had multiple meanings in ancient times. 
Some scholars have suggested that the symbol represented the reptilian nature of the Anunnaki and their alleged connection to a reptilian alien race, while others have linked to the coiled serpent as a symbol of Kundalini, of spiritual knowledge and wisdom. Interestingly, the Caduceus is also the magic wand carried by Hermes, also known as Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom. And not only, the Caduceus of Enki and later on Hermes features at the top of the central rod the pine cone that represents the gift of Kundalini awareness when activated. Often when the Caduceus is winged, meaning that in our deepest meditations we can fly and access all knowledge and tools for healing. Another enigmatic object seen in the Sumerian art is the bracelet that most of the major Anunnaki gods wear. The meaning of these bracelets is unknown, but some believe that they were not randomly depicted and there has to be a deeper symbolic meaning. They remind us a little bit of watches. But the most intriguing object that the Anunnaki hold is a pine cone which is always directed towards something. Do we know anything about the pine cones in ancient Mesopotamia? What were they believed to represent or symbolize in ancient times? From esoteric perspective, the pine cone can be seen as a symbol of spiritual enlightenment and awakening. The pine cone is a symbol that has been used in many cultures and religions throughout history, including ancient Sumerian, Egyptian and Greek cultures. The pine cone was sometimes used as a sacred offering or as a symbol of the divine. For example, in ancient Egypt, the staff of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, was depicted with a pine cone at the top. In Hinduism, the pine cone is sometimes associated with Lord Shiva, the god of destruction and transformation. The Pope's staff, also known as the Papal Ferula, features a pine cone as a decorative element. In Vatican Square, there is a bronze sculpture of a pine cone that is known as the largest in the world. It is located in the courtyard of the pine cone and is considered a significant symbol of the Vatican's spiritual and historical significance. Why? In some esoteric traditions, the pine cone is also seen as a symbol of regeneration and rebirth. This is because the pine cone contains seeds that can be used to grow new trees symbolizing the cycle of life, death and rebirth. Cunifar pine trees are one of the oldest plant genera on the planet, having existed much longer than all flowering plant species combined. Pine cones, the evolutionary precursor to flowers, have spines that spiral in perfect Fibonacci sequence, similar to the sacred geometry of a rose or a sunflower. In most of the ancient cultures, the pine cone was associated with the pineal gland, likely due to the pineal gland's pine cone-like shape. The pineal gland, named after a shape like a pine cone, is located at the geometric center of our brain and is closely linked to our perception of light. It is a small endocrine gland responsible for producing secreting melatonin, which regulates sleep-wake patterns and circadian rhythms receives more blood flow than, than any other area of the body except the kidneys and is uniquely isolated from the blood-brain barrier system. The pineal gland is also associated with spiritual and mystical experiences and has been referred to as the third eye in some spiritual traditions or the seed of the soul. It is said to be the gateway to higher state of consciousness and spiritual experiences. Rick Strassman, a psychopharmacologist, believes that the third eye is the source to psychedelic DMT in our bodies. Strassman has hypothesized that large amounts of DMT are released in our bodies during heightened states of spiritual consciousness such as birth, death and near-death experiences, or perhaps during the awakening of our Kundalini in a moment of enlightenment. Synthesized DMT or plants containing DMT are often used as a recreational psychedelics or in shamanic ceremonies such as the ayahuasca ceremony originating in South America. DMT users often report intense experiences of spiritual awakening contact with entities of supernatural or spiritual origin and the dilation or compression of time. 
And what is interesting is that the among the reports of thousands users experiencing with ayahuasca, the serpent is documented as the most commonly appearing archetype in their spiritual visions. The pine cone is a special symbol because the spiral pattern found in pine cones is known to contain the golden ratio, or also known as the divine proportion. The golden ratio is a mathematical proportion that is found throughout nature and is associated with beauty, harmony and balance. In case of the pine cone, the spiral pattern is created by a series of spirals that curve in opposite directions, forming a distinctive pattern that closely follows the golden ratio. The golden ratio is part of the sacred geometry which is often seen as a way of revealing the blueprint of creation as it is believed to tap into the fundamental principles and patterns that underlie the universe. So now, it is even more evident that the pine cone that the Anunnaki were holding was not there by chance. But in fact, it symbolizes sacred knowledge, the blueprint of creation of the whole universe and carries the message of spiritual awakening and enlightenment that can be achieved through the activation of the pineal gland. And so it comes out that the Anunnaki not only created humans as slaves, they also played a role in the evolution of human consciousness, helping humans to access and cultivate their spiritual potential. By their genes with that of Homo erectus, they also encoded in our DNA sacred knowledge of the universe and of the source of everything. Knowledge that throughout history we have deeply forgotten, but it is still there planted somewhere in our DNA, and we still have the ability to remember it and activate it. Other intriguing traits associated with the Anunnaki include the mysterious bag depicted in ancient artwork, which some researchers believe was a container for the water of life, a substance used in the Anunnaki's genetic experiments on humans and animals. Or, what if they were carrying the seeds inside them? The bags held by the Anunnaki in ancient Mesopotamian art could have represented a variety of different things. One interpretation is that the bags may have represented the Anunnaki's role as keepers of the secrets or keepers of the knowledge. In this interpretation, the bags could be seen as containers for advanced knowledge and technology representing the Anunnaki's role as the guardians and protectors of ancient wisdom. Elsewhere, the hang bag image shows up with striking similarities in two stone reliefs, one made by the Assyrian of ancient Iraq sometime between 880-859 BC and the other made by the Olmecs of ancient Mesoamerica sometime between 12,400 BC. In both of these images, a man-like figure carries the handbag in his hand as if it were a basket or purse. When used in Assyrian art, it is said the purse holds a magic dust, probably symbolizing the fertilization of earth by the Anunnaki. After all, they were believed to be the creators of our planet. In contemporary times, the Anunnaki are often depicted as the equivalent of the Creator God in the Old Testament. But could there be evidence of the Anunnaki's existence in ancient texts such as the Bible and archaeological discoveries, and how would we know for certain? There are various mentions of extraterrestrial encounters in the Bible, including descriptions of vehicles such as clouds, pillars and dwellings, and references to UFOs as flying furnace and burning bushes. The book of Genesis also mentions the sons of God having offspring with human females, resulting in hybrid beings known as the Nephilim. They are described as possessing a cloak or garment that gave them power similar to those of the Anunnaki of Sumeria. Ancient texts such as the ones Zechariah Sitchin was deciphering imply that the Anunnaki owned the Garden of Eden. So, it turns out that the serpent was a member of the Anunnaki, not just a biblical creature. It is speculated that it was indeed Enki himself, who transformed into a serpent to give the knowledge of mating to his children Adamo. And it seems logical since Enki has always been associated with the symbol of the serpent. 
The Book of Ezekiel also describes possible extraterrestrial encounters. Ezekiel is a major prophet in the Old Testament of the Bible. He was a priest who was living in exile in the city of Babylon. According to the Bible, Ezekiel was chosen by God to receive visions and messages, which he then delivered to the people of Israel to guide them and warn them of coming judgment. Ezekiel's prophecies are recorded in the book of Ezekiel, which is one of the books of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament. According to Ezekiel's book, he had a vision of being with wings that moved and made tremendous noise and a wheel that moved without making a steering movement. At first, Ezekiel thought that what he saw was God and he fell on the ground to pray. However, he later realized that it was not God and described what he saw. These descriptions bear a striking resemblance to what modern-day UFO sightings look like. Some researchers have speculated that being with wings could be a representation of extraterrestrial spacecraft and the wheel could be a depiction of a type of propulsion system that aliens might use. Interestingly, the original Hebrew text of Ezekiel does not mention the word God, but instead refers to the splendor of the highest. In the book of Ezekiel, the splendor of the highest arrives a second time causing Ezekiel to feel the gravity and gives him a measuring device to measure a building. So, can Ezekiel's descriptions be interpreted as evidence of contact with extraterrestrial beings in ancient times? What if it was the same as the Anunnaki? So far, we've seen that it's a fact that there is a widespread belief that the Anunnaki were alien entities who played a significant role in shaping human history. However, is there any proof? To answer this, we'll go back 20 years. The location is Iraq. During Operation Iraq Freedom, American troops were deployed to maintain order in Baghdad. However, looters took advantage of the chaos and destroyed numerous ancient artifacts including musical instruments and cuneiform tablets. It is believed that the cuneiform tablets that were stolen from Iraq museums during the chaos of the war in 2003 contained crucial information about the Anunnaki and their connection to extraterrestrial beings. The coordinated and organized nature of the theft, with individuals using earpieces to gain access to double locked doors and steal valuable items, suggests that this was not a random act of war. So the question is, was this a deliberate attempt to conceal forbidden knowledge from the past? What if the stolen texts contain significant information that supports the theory of an Anunnaki connection and the involvement of extraterrestrial beings in shaping human history? Millions of people worldwide are interested in the possibility that extraterrestrial beings have played a significant role in human history. The theft of the priceless artifact from the National Museum in Baghdad highlights the importance of preserving and studying the past to gain a better understanding of our origins and the potential involvement of extraterrestrial beings in shaping our destiny. And if we think about that, imagine how much historical accounts have been reshaped and rewritten so that the real history remains hidden and what we know today is nothing but a tiny part of the truth. The falsification of history has done more to impede human development than any other thing known to mankind. How would our view of history change if we confirmed the Anunnaki's role in shaping human civilization? Will we need to rewrite our history books and if so, how would that affect our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world? Not only the fact that we are not alone, but also that we carry a sacred divine knowledge within our DNA. From Noah's Ark in the Bible to the Mesopotamian accounts of Utnapishtim, Zizdura, and Atrahasis, the narratives of a devastating deluge, and the determined survivors who preserve life on Earth are intertwined in our collective memory. This shared mythology spans continents and cultures with striking similarities, suggesting a common origin or perhaps a historical event that left an inerasable mark on human consciousness. 
consciousness. What could have triggered such a myth? And is it possible that these tales conceal evidence of extraterrestrial involvement in Earth's ancient past? Could the Great Flood represent a catastrophic event orchestrated or influenced by ancient aliens which reshaped the face of Earth and forever altered the course of human development, as well as our understanding of the cosmos and our place within it. The notion of a cataclysmic event that shocked the world is not just a figment of human imagination. In fact, there are myriad of ancient accounts describing lost cities and great floods which can be found across different cultures and civilizations. Tales of divine retribution in the form of devastating floods are prevalent in various myths hinting at a shared experience among diverse societies. One such legend that recounts a great flood sent by the gods to cleanse the world is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Actually, there are several Sumerian myths about the Great Flood that bear striking similarities to the biblical story of Noah's Ark, which has led some researchers to believe that they share a common origin. In the Bible's book of Genesis, it is written that Yahweh, who created man from dust, decided to bring the Great Flood to earth because of mankind's increasing corruption and downfall. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Yahweh was however pleased with Noah and instructed him to create an ark for saving humans and animals. On completion of the ark, Noah, his entire family and two of every type of animal on earth entered the ark. Once the door of the ark was closed, the destructive flood started and cleared all other living beings from the face of the earth. After the flood ended, everyone inside the ark came out and Yahweh promised never to subject humans to something like the Great Flood again. The rainbow is known as the symbol of Yahweh's promise. But what if before the story of Noah and the Flood there is another version of this catastrophic event and of a human who was saved by the gods. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the hero encounters the character Utnapishtim who, like Noah, was instructed by a god to build a large boat and fill it with animals and his family in anticipation of a great flood. But what was the reason behind the flood described there? Was it sent again as punishment for humanity? The myth begins with the creation of humans by the gods, also known as the Anunnaki, or in other words, the extraterrestrial beings who came from the sky. Enki genetically engineered and mixed the DNA of Homo erectus with his own and created humans to work as laborers who mine gold taking care of the gods' needs and maintaining their temples. Over time, the human population grew and their noise disturbed Enlil, Enki's brother and the main ruler of Earth, who couldn't sleep because of it. Enlil convened a council of the gods and they decided to send a series of plagues and famines to reduce the human population. 1200 years had not yet passed when the land extended and the peoples multiplied. The land was billowing like a bull. The god got disturbed with their uproar. Enlil heard their noise and addressed the great gods. The noise of mankind has become too intense for me. With their uproar, I am deprived of sleep. Cut off supplies for the peoples. Let there be a scarcity of planet life to satisfy their hunger. Finally, Enlil decided to send a great flood to wipe out humanity once and for all. But Enki, feeling compassionate towards the humans he had created, decided to defy Enlil's plan. He appeared to Atrahasis Utnapishtim in a dream, revealing the divine plan to send a flood and providing detailed instructions to build a massive boat that would save him, 
his family and a pair of each animal species. And Lil, upon discovering that Atrahasis and his family had survived, was initially furious with Enki for defying his orders. However, the other gods including Enki persuaded Enlil to accept the survival of humanity as a necessary part of the divine plan. Enlil relented and blessed Atrahasis and his family. He also made a covenant with humanity, vowing never to send another flood to destroy them completely. The Great Flood is present in the myths of ancient cultures and its potential extraterrestrial origin raises questions such as why it happened and what caused it. Some researchers suggest that these beings could have been attempting to destroy a hybrid race of giants, the result of interbreeding between extraterrestrial and human women as described in the ancient Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is a non-canonical Jewish religious text that tells the story of Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, who lived in the antediluvian period before the Great Flood. Enoch is portrayed as a righteous man who receives divine revelations and is granted access to heavenly realms. He is shown the mysteries of creation and the workings of celestial bodies and the ultimate fate of humanity. Enoch also learns about the Watchers, the fallen angels who did disobeyed God and caused corruption on earth. These celestial beings were said to have been captivated by human women and engaged in relationships with them, resulting in the birth of a hybrid race known as the Nephilim. The Nephilim were described as giants and were thought to possess immense strength and power which they used to corrupt and wreak havoc on earth. According to the Book of Giants, the Nephilim were responsible for committing dreadful acts, including the merciless killing of humans and even consuming their flesh. As a result, God determines that the earth must undergo a purification process and selects Noah, the great-grandson of Enoch, as the chosen individual to begin humanity afresh. The interbreeding between humans and these otherworldly beings could have been seen as a violation of the natural order and thus the Great Flood might have been orchestrated as a response to this transgression. If extraterrestrial beings possessed advanced technologies, as many ancient astronaut theorists suggest, they could have had the capability to manipulate celestial bodies, like comets or asteroids, and direct them towards Earth to initiate the Great Flood. In this context, the purpose behind the flood might have been to clean the earth of the Nephilim who were considered an abomination and to reset the balance of life on the planet. In ancient Hindu teaching, the story of Manu parallels the experience of Utnapishtim or Noah as he receives divine guidance to build a ship and save himself along with various creatures from the impending deluge. So who was Manu? In Hindu mythology, Manu is the first man and king who rescues life on earth from a catastrophic flood. When a small fish, later revealed to be the god Vishnu in disguise, asks Manu for protection, he promises to save Manu from the upcoming deluge. Following Vishnu's instructions, Manu builds a large boat and fills it with pairs of creatures and seeds from various plants. As the flood arrives, Vishnu, in the form of a massive fish, guides the boat through the turbulent waters. Once the flood waters recede, Manu's boat comes to the rest on a mountain and he proceeds to repopulate the earth with the creatures and plants he had saved. We know that the Hindu gods have quite enigmatic appearances, and Vishnu with his distinctive blue skin, multiple arms and celestial vimana has sparked speculation about his potential extraterrestrial nature. Not only that, in the story of Manu, Vishnu has disguised as a giant fish, which means he could transform or shape-shift his material body just as many alien beings are described to do. Could Vishnu be a link to a celestial race that once walked among us? The striking similarity in these stories across such diverse cultures has led many anthropologists to speculate that these myths may be rooted in a real event. A catastrophe so immense and unforgettable that it was engraved into the collective memory of humanity and passed down through generations as mythology. 
The search for evidence supporting ancient flood accounts has led scientists to uncover intriguing clues pointing to the possibility of a global flood or at least a series of significant regional floods. One such clue is the discovery of a potential asteroid impact site in the Indian Ocean. When we find the answers to these questions, we will hold the key to understanding our origins, our purpose, and our ultimate destiny. The Great Flood as a turning point in human history highlights the complexities of our origins and the potential role of extraterrestrial beings in shaping our past. As we continue to explore our history and the mysteries of the universe, we must consider the possibility that this cataclysm was more than just a natural catastrophe and may have served a greater purpose in the evolution of humankind. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Keep your minds open and until we meet again.